The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 108. Captain DeBridge, Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Deep Space Nine episode, Dax. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Be sure to retweet us on Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and make sure to leave comments. We'd love to engage with you on social media. Uh, it's one of our favorite things. And that's a great place where we get your feedback to use in the show. So let's uh, talk about this episode. It is, uh, the, we're still in the first season. It is the eighth or so episode, seventh or eighth episode of the season. This one was originally written, at least the teleplay was co-written by DC Fontana, right. who is one of the best known Star Trek scriptwriters from the original series. She wrote Charlie X, This Side of Paradise, The Journey to Babel. But it's only co-written by her. Yes, and she was. This was her only credit on DS Nine too, as well. and it was her last credit on Star Trek. And DC, I love DC Fontana. She was one of the best writers on Star Trek. When you see her name on a script, though, as a co something, it meant there were problems, and she was brought in to fix it. <laughs> right. And so, I didn't need to know about DC Fontana only having a co teleplay credit on this to tell me there would be problems. Because it's a first season episode with a one word title. <laughs> and first season episodes with one word titles uh, on different shows. I mean, this is true of the X Files as well. One of the worst ones is Space. Okay, an X Files episode just called Space. <laughs> yeah, like that's going to be good. <laughs> you have these super general titles in first season episodes, it tells you the writers don't really know what they're doing yet. And mm. this particular one-word title is especially ominous. It's just Dax. And that yep. means this is going to be a Dax-centric episode to help us understand the concept of Dax and who she is. So this is going to be an episode that is, because we don't know what else to do, we're just going to kind of focus on a character and it's going to be really clunky as an introduction to that character. Now, I didn't think, it, because DC Fontana participated, I thought it had good aspects. It wasn't as clunky as it could be, but it's it, you can just imagine the writer's room for this. It's like, oh, well, we need to, oh, we need to introduce our characters. Let's do an episode on Dax that focuses mm -hmm. on the Dax symbiont and, 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 okay, good, approved, just go do that. And that's about the level of thought that probably happened with the initial pitch. It was just a concept. We need an episode on this character. Oh, yeah, just just go do it. Well, and that, and in itself, having an episode, especially in the first season of something like DS9, you know, episodes centered on particular characters, so we can get to know them better. Right. It it, is in itself a very good thing, but they should be fleshed out a lot better than this. Yeah, and the 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 thing that's the warning signal to me is the one word title. They because if if they had something to introduce us to Dax, I mean, we need to meet the characters, we need to understand what's distinctive about them. But if the level of thought at the approval process was just, oh yeah, it's going to introduce Dax, so call it Dax. Mm -hmm. That's not a good sign. It, it, you know, it could have been, I, I don't know, but off the top of my head, based on what they do with this episode, if they had given it a title like, you know, uh, Long Hidden Truths or That Sins Which Must Not past. Be Spoken or something yeah. more creative, it would be a better sign for where the episode's going to go. 
I'm curious at what point they actually give titles to the episodes at the beginning or the end, but of the process. But that's a good. Uh, well, probably from, it, it actually varies, but this yeah. sounds like a working title that just stuck. Yep. Yeah. Well, the from their point of view, uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf, who is one of the producers uh, in, in in throughout different Star Trek series, said with this. Now, to, th- now, obviously, this is in retrospect, so they may be trying to clean things up for us a- after the fact. Uh, he says, this is for the first time they wanted to show the real potential of the characters of DS9 and what sets them apart from other Trek characters. Mm-hmm. So the the edginess th- that we would see really in large uh, part in later seasons, how they're not just heroes um, mm-hmm. that, you know, who are innocent, or as Wolf says, our heroes don't have to be innocent all the time. Our heroes are fallible, interesting, and complicated people. Yeah, so, good idea. Yeah. Go with that. So, <laughs> now, I, I'm more positive about this episode, I think, than you guys are. I, I, there, I do recognize there, there, there are issues, um, especially given Terry Farrell's, the fact that she doesn't actually do much at all in this episode. As, the, Dax doesn't have much to do. Well, and it, what I was coming before we started recording is, you know, one good thing about this is she didn't have to act very much. She just had to look moody. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> there, there, she was not asked to do much for uh, being all about Dax. So. And, and and I don't mind. I think it, uh, another difference is, is I think you, Dom, are less happy with Terry Farrell's acting early on in Deep Space Nine, right? Than I am. I'm. I don't. I don't fault her early acting performances. No. I don't think the same way you do. In fact, I like the way she. There's a very uncomfortable scene at the beginning between her and Brashear that we'll talk about. Yeah. And I actually like her performance in that. She totally blows him off without being mad or cruel to him. She 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 conveys what she does in later seasons of I'm just kind of above this, but I'm also kind of amused by you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh and and I like the, and that's conveyed on the performance level. Where my problems with this episode are is on the writing level, right. not the performance level. Yeah, I think uh, Terry Farrell in the early season, she's just, I think she's trying to come to grips. And we, we, we talked about before how she's she's really new to acting at this point in her career. And yeah. it was one of her first jobs. But she's trying to come to grips with this. I'm a young woman with an old being inside. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm really old, but really young at the same time. And I think she's still trying to come to grips with what and, that means. And, so and that's, working with people like Avery Brooks and Cole Meany and Na- Nana Visitor at People who've had careers and have built, you know, these these were relatively well known actors at the point of DS Nine coming out, and then she comes in as this rank amateur, basically. And, and not only are they more experienced than her, some of them are scary people, like Avery Brooks and <laughs> mm-hmm. Nana Visitor. Yes, Avery Brooks, exactly. Hawk. I mean, he he. he I mean, he, off screen, he is Hawk. So <laughs> from Spencer. So yeah, he is. He, it's well known how intense Avery Brooks is. So the, one of the other things is that the writers have said is that they wanted to, this episode wanted to explore the complexities of Dax and Trill society and this concept of what, what, is, what does it mean to carry around a, in, inside you a creature that's long lived? And it, in a sense, it's sort of like Doctor Who, that the, the, the being, the yeah. memories continue. The, the, there's a, a single person that has a throughput, but the personality and the face are constantly changing. And what does that mean? Now, yeah. with the Doctor, then, it's then, still then one Kurt, being. Then Curzon fell off the radio telescope and regenerated, and we had Jed Zia. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or um, the Curzon uh, got exposed to radiation and regenerated, and we had uh, a girl Esri. <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, a girl for the first time. Right? Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Then Jed Zia doesn't have enough vials of the uh, of of the of the uh, bat milk and gives one to her companion and. Doesn't have enough, so she <laughs> dies and regenerates and becomes Esri. That's right. And everybody That's who's right. not interested in Doctor Who has just switched off the podcast. I'm They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> anyway. uh, one other thing to note is that uh, there is no uh, Chief O'Brien in this episode. Colmini apparently had the week off or something, but uh, but there was no yeah, they, no Brian yeah, here. They just rid him out. He's just like, uh, he's on vacation. He's, he went, they I, went I, to visit Keiko's mom. It was her birthday. For, for her 100th birthday. I like that they, they have that in a little, nice little indication yeah. the human lifespan is, is longer now. Now, this is, yes. this is the second episode of Row, Row of Star Trek where we've had a major character have vacation time. And so yeah, they're written right. out. Last week it was Riker. This week it's O'Brien. Yeah. Now, Bashir gets very little screen time in this one, too, but that's probably for the best. 
<laughs> let's let's start there. Okay, so uh, we start on the promenade, Bashir and and in the replomat. In the replomat, and Bashir's still doing his puppy dog routine with vi- wildly inappropriate come ons. I mean, oh. it's just ick. I mean, even in nineteen ninety whatever, nineteen ninety three, this was bad. Yeah. Now from two thousand twenty, it's just really yeah. bad. It, um, it's it's in. It, I don't I don't view this as puppy dog. This is be uh, this is sinister. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, as a, he, he, yeah, because what he does is it's apparently night, although you wouldn't know it because it's always night in space. Right. But they're on the night shift. They're getting ready to go to bed. For some reason, they are drinking Klingon coffee right before yes. bedtime. Yep. And but on the positive side, we do have our first mention of Ractagino ever. Yep. Yes. But they're drinking coffee right before bedtime, and Brashear has this line about, I can think of more interesting ways to keep you up at night. And it's Ugh. like, oh, man, this... no, just <laughs> no. And But what I like is uh, yeah. she ignores that and keeps yep. on about what she was doing already, which was like reading some kind of technical manual. And she doesn't humiliate him. But instead, right. as she walks away, she she declines his invitation. And as she walks away, she has this little smile on her face, conveying the, oh, yeah, I remember what it was like to be young thing, even though she's physically young, but she's just above right. it because she's 300 years old with the symbiont. And right. so she's just playing on a completely different level than he is. Yeah, I, I write here that uh, Melanie, my wife, would roll her eyes at his uh, really lame come ons. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and we and, and then at the end of this, she said, "You know, may I ask you?" He says, "May I ask you to your quarters?" She says, "That's not necessary." Julian says, oh, "All right, good night." But and after she's left, he goes, hmm, "Not necessary, but not forbidden either." Like, dude, take a hint. <laughs> yeah, and, and it turns out. Julian is not the only one stalking Jadzia. There are yep. two other right. stalkers that she has attracted. Right. Or three others, actually, that have been watching her from behind some kind of grill. And as she gets to her quarters, they grab her. In the hall, yeah. And Brashear, at that moment, because he got a late start, uh, shows up and fisticuffs ensue. And Brashear is yeah. KO'd. Yeah, he gets his butt kicked. And... <laughs> So they're both knocked out, and uh, Dax and Bashir. And Dax is taken by these three people. Uh, Bashir wakes up and calls Ops, where Cisco puts the station on alert. Uh, and these people who've grabbed her seem to know the station very well. They've already disabled the tractor beam, which we, we got a hint of this before with uh, Kira saying something about it. Uh, and they, they're able to get through all of Odo's security procedures. And... There's a lot of running around through quarters, but Cisco manages to get the tractor beam online just in time. Yeah, and I like how their investigation proceeds. This, I thought this was effective writing, because now that they know there's a problem, it's like, oh, that's why we had this mysterious reading here. It's because mm-hmm. our tractor beam's offline. And then Kira is like, okay, so if they know about the station, they probably know the speed of our runabouts, and they would want to have a faster ship standing yeah. by. So let's look at all of the high warp ships that are currently here as a way of limiting our candidates. And it's nice. It's good deductive reasoning trying to solve yep. this problem. That's good. And then and as, as you say, they do, well, actually, before they get on the ship, they try to stop them with force fields in the airlock yes. to the ship. Kira says she's going to isolate them with Cateron force fields. Because ordinary force fields aren't good enough, apparently. <laughs> nope. So they're going to use Cateron force fields, but they are immediately overridden, which is another sign of how these criminals are really savvy. They really know a lot about the station. And then they get the tractor beam back online, techno babble ensues, and we've caught them. Right. Yep. And so they go and uh, confront them. Odo's there. And when he. He tells them to come out of the ship with extremities where I can see them because yeah. they're aliens. <laughs> not, not <after>. Nice line. <laughs> yeah. uh, and when they, they, the head of this little group, is, we'll find her, his name is Elon Pandro, says, Ilon. Uh, are you, uh, Ilon, yep, Elon, sorry. Uh, he says, um, this is an extradition. I'm a special envoy from Clestron 4. And uh, his, he says, this world's treaty with the Federation allows for unilateral extradition. And Dax is charged with treason and the murder of his father. Yeah, and 
there are a few interesting things here. So the the way he pronounces the name of his home planet is Klystron 4. Yes. And I'm like, is that a coincidence? Do you guys know that a Klystron... You're saying he's from a vacuum tube. A Klystron. Because a <laughs> Klystron is a kind of vacuum tube that was invented in 1937. It's like saying, <laughs> I'm from the planet X-Ray 4. You know, it, 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 if, so that's a little weird. I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure what they did is they found, hey, this is a good sounding word name for a planet. This will work. Yeah, yeah. Right. Also, this unilateral extradition thing is weird. I, I That's not like a real legal term in no. the real world. I mean, extradition is, but unilateral extradition is not, some, from what I've been able to tell. And it would seem to imply you can just go grab somebody yeah. if it's unilateral. That's kind of like something we do have in the real world, which is extraordinary rendition, yeah. where you just go grab somebody, even if they're in somebody else's country, you grab them and take them away. And But the thing about extraordinary rendition is it's extrajudicial. So you, it's technically sort of like illegal. You wouldn't have a treaty specifying you can do extraordinary rendition. Right. And then they even take the edge off of unilateral extradition later because he's got a warrant and Cisco says, you should have then done the right thing and shown me the warrant up front like you were supposed to do. The fact that you didn't show me the warrant tells me there's more to this situation than you're admitting. So if if he was supposed to show them the warrant, then it's not really unilateral. It's like any other extradition situation. Yeah, although they kind of explain it with the dialogue a little bit with why th that there's a wrinkle that he's hoping to, uh, that uh, Cisco doesn't notice, which we'll get to in a in a yeah. sec. But yeah, but but I do want to point out the actor who plays uh, Elon Elon Tandro is a uh, longtime character actor Gregory Itzen, who who's actually been in uh, a several star trek episodes he was in he'll like be five. in five yeah he'll be in ds9 again in who mourns for morn uh mm -hmm. and then he's going to be in voyager an episode and then two more episodes of enterprise so uh, and then he's been a, done a bunch of other stuff that you've definitely noticed him in he was in 24 i think uh all, he was the, the president, vice president in 24 yeah mm -hmm. vice president then president so he's done a bunch of stuff good actor um odo uh, says that the warrants claims that dax killed general Ardalan tendro 30 years ago when he was Curzon Dax uh, and Curzon was the Federation mediator for a civil war on Klystron 4. Um, Cisco. And, and yeah. also he, he be, Curzon not only killed General Tandro, but also betrayed the government to the rebels. Right. He, yes. So that was uh, the treason part. Yes. Uh, by, by betraying uh, Tandro to the rebels. Cisco then says uh, that the Curzon he knows, knew was a little cavalier about life, but with more faults than the usual socially acceptable trill, but he wasn't a murderer. So we're really, you know, we've, we've established before and we're continuing to establish that Curzon was a character, was a real character. Yeah. And at this early stage, Odo is really suspicious. And that makes sense because he, he, he doesn't know these people. Yes. Um, so he's perfectly happy to entertain the idea that Curs that Curzon did these things because he doesn't know Dax. And uh, this is where Cisco goes to confront Jadzia about what's going on, but she refuses to help. She just stays, like most of the episode, <laughs> silent. <laughs> um, well, she says and, and yeah. prickly. She's yes. like very cool. He's at one point Avery Brooks gets mad or Cisco gets mad and says, "I'm trying to help you," and so I don't expect any help from you, but thank you. <laughs> right, right, which is infuriating. Cisco, you know, he says, uh, you know, that he tries to play on the fact that they've been friends for 20 years. Uh, and she says, the friend you knew was Curzon, not Jedzia. And that's, this plays into the episode because the her defense that Cisco tries to, to mount for her without her cooperation is she's not Curzon, and, and which is undermines his entirety of his relationship with with Jadzia, this idea that she's in some way still Curzon. So it's kind of an interesting that they don't even really bring this out, they wish they could have, but he's undermining his own relationship with her in order to save her mm -hmm. from this the consequences of this warrant. So we then get to the next kind of legal stage of this, which is he he to help her despite the fact she apparently doesn't want to be helped. 
he shifts the legal grounds because right. the Klystron people apparently are not members of the Federation. They are allies, in fact, of the Cardassians, but they have this treaty with the Federation. And so Cisco shifts the venue from Federation courts to Bajoran. Right. Because they're not on in in the Federation here. They're not in the Federation, and they don't have an extradition treaty with the Klystrons because they're Cardassian allies. Right. And so that enables him to get to have a way of slowing things down. He even suggests that that's why they tried kidnapping Jadzia instead of showing him the warrant because this is a Bajoran station. And Tandro says, oh, no, that's not why. I mean, I couldn't imagine the Bajorans objecting. Their interests aren't involved. At which point, uh, Cisco has Major Kira get involved. And it's like, uh, you kind of know a freakishly enormous amount about our station that constitutes a security breach. We think you got all that information from the Cardassians. So, yeah, our interests are involved big time. She says, uh, a great line here, by the way, that not only compromises Bajoran security, it annoys us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I love it too, where he where he tried to go. Well, I'm not talking with you. I'm talking with Cisco, and uh, Commander Cisco goes, "No, you're you're talking with her now. This this is her bailiwick. <laughs> this not my yeah, room. Yes. This is your this is hers. Talk to her." So then we need a space for this Bajoran hearing to take place, and Odo arranges it to be in Quark's bar, and we have Quark. this neat scene between Quark and Odo, where. Quark is like, it's going to take two days for that hearing. That's too much loss of business. Business is business. I'm not shutting down, even for Jadzia. And Odo starts throwing building code violations at him, all the changes he's going to need to make. And Quark is like, this is blackmail. No, just business. And business is business. Yeah. Yes. And and then rather than reveal to Cisco what he did to get Quark to agree, Odo just tells Cisco, oh, Quark's volunteered. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, nice it, gesture. It, I thought the, so. <laughs> the idea, the idea of using the bar as as the 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 courtroom is very um very Practical. old west. You know, yeah. you think kind of like yeah. the old west. You know, the, the the bar was the was kind of the, the biggest place where people would actually gather for stuff like that. I saw a behind the scenes note on Memory Alpha about that because it's not really logical. They have plenty of meeting space on this ginormous space station. And later in a later season, when Worf is on trial, they actually have like a hearing room, you know, that's a conference room they're using for yep. a hearing. They could have, they, they said they could have built one here for that purpose, but they just liked the, the bar set. They wanted to show it off. <laughs> Still new. Uh, so they, we have this hearing and we have this judge, this elderly Bajoran woman who tells everyone that the hearing will be informal and quick. Uh, she's 100 years old and just doesn't want to die while they have the hearing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and also while the hearing is going on, uh, Cisco has sent Odo to Klystron 4 to dig into all this. So that's yeah. happening in parallel to the hearing. And I really love the judge or Madame Arbiter, yeah. as she's yes. called. She has, she's, it's, it's a great actress. We've seen her in other things before, but she is a great actress and has this great, vinegary attitude. She's just yep. very yeah. acerbic, and she's a delight to watch. She also has this alien gavel that they yep. made for her that's basically a sphere, and it's just a little, like, it's about the size of a pool ball or a little bit bigger than a pool ball. Mm -hmm. But if you imagine, like, hitting a pool ball on a Formica surface, it makes the most satisfying clack. Mac. Yep. Yeah. Did we see something, the Klingons used something similar yeah. in Star Trek VI, I think it was? In, in Star Trek VI, at the Rura Penthe sen sentencing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, a nice note on Memory Alpha from Rick Sternbach about the design of it. I, I do like that they went to the, to the level of designing a specific gavel just for the Bajoran judge. Now that the hearing has begun, this is where the episode starts to go off the rails for yeah. me. Okay. Be even though I love Madame Arbiter, I do not love what's happening legally because mm -hmm. the question of is a host responsible for, is a current host responsible for the actions of previous hosts is a question that would have been settled in Trill Law thousands of years ago mm. since they're co evolved species. And so that should be the very first point that gets raised. And it is not raised until the very end of the episode. And we don't even get an answer 
at the end of the episode, Ilon is going to ask Jadzia, didn't you voluntarily accept all these responsibilities when you became a host? And before she can answer, the deus ex machina swoops in to solve the episode. But this is the thing that the whole episode turns on. It should have been settled thousands of years ago. The, they're doing sloppy writing by not bringing it out first. What they should have done to generate drama is bring it out first, have Ilon make the point on Trill aren't, isn't a host responsible for all the actions of the previous hosts. Jadzia is forced to admit that, and, and Madam Arbiter is about to say, okay, extradition granted, and now we have to fight that concept. That would have been the creative way to handle this. This is the sloppy way. Well, this, this is what I hate about uh, trial episodes in things like Star Trek, because they're so loose. Of course, you know, logic in, in Star Trek, let's be honest, isn't always the most uh, strict thing it, to begin with. They're, they're pretty loose with logic. But then you bring the trial structure in where you've got to be much more tight with your logic, much more tight with your argumentation. And they very rarely do that. And this, this is... In the, this. It wasn't clear at the beginning. I'm I'm not the biggest fan of this episode. There are parts of this episode I like, kind of like we talked about before. But this is the point where it's just like, if they cut the whole extradition hearing part out, it would be great. It would be a fine episode. But it's this whole part with the hearing, other than the Madam Arbiter, this is the point where it just, it goes off the rails for me. Okay. Yeah. I, I can even imagine the kind of logic that they would use at this point where, Elon's or Ilon's argument would be, well, wait, okay, so you're a Trill, they're part of the Federation, the Federation accepts Trill law, and you have a treaty with Bajor, therefore Bajor should recognize you as a Federation citizen subject to Federation law, I get to extradite you. Mm -hmm. And the counter argument should be, well, wait a minute, even though we have a treaty with the Federation, that doesn't mean that we have to totally submit. To Federation law because we're not a member and therefore there may be legal room for us to recognize Jadzia as a different legal entity than Curzon Dax. And yeah, I did take the uh, LSAT test for law school <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> then maybe they should get lawyers to write these episodes. Uh, so uh, Tandra does tell the judge, she asks like, why are you coming up with this extradition order? 30 years after the events, and, he's, and he says because they were sealed in military files that were only recently uncovered. Cisco then brings in his main argument, which is that the charges are against Dax, but not Jadzia Dax, a female, but to the deceased Curzon Dax, who is a male. So they can't possibly be the same person. At which point I wrote, oh, how quaint. <laughs> 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 so uh, this, this is a very much a 30-year-old episode. So uh, Tandro says that... Uh, Cisco is arguing semantics because the Dax symbiont is the same, which I don't think is actually semantics. Mm, no. <laughs> That's no. biology. And Cisco says a new host, new person, and the person who's, who's charged is no, no longer exists. And that puts the judge, she says, oh, now you put me in a bind. Now we have to determine whether this is the same person or not. And she specifically cites the fact that because the penalty on Klystron 4 for these crimes is death... Mm -hmm. And that actually, that's good, because that reflects real-world reasoning between different nations. Here in the U.S., we have the death penalty, and that does cause problems with extradition from nations that don't have the death penalty. And they know if, okay, if you're going to be subject to the death penalty, we're going to take a second look at your extradition and whether we're going to actually grant it or not. So uh, outside the hearing, now that there's a recess for them to gather their evidence, uh, Cisco is meeting with Bashir and Kira. He tells Bashir to find evidence to support his contention that G Jadzia and Curzon are two entirely separate people, which will be tough for Cisco to prove since he still claims he's still friends with Dax. That's what I, like, I, I was waiting for Tandra to bring that up, by the way, that you're still friends with Dax. You still call him old man. So, mm -hmm. uh, but that never comes up. Cisco tells Kira to find all judicial precedents that says Trill are not responsible for the acts of antecedent hosts. So this kind of is where they bring up that thing you mentioned mm -hmm. before. Jed, and, and Kira says, well, what if I find that the law says something different? Then he says, and that's the wrong answer. Keep looking. Which is, actually reflects certain legal truths that we have today, which yeah. is that mm -hmm. lawyers will, even if they find a precedent that disagrees with them, they know that if you dig long enough, you'll find some judge who ruled the other way, and you'll try to make that stick. 
And and like a uh, like a reasonable lawyer, Cisco tells Kira. And if if you do find a wrong answer, I want to yeah. know about it so I know how to deal with it. Right. Yeah. Um. And all that's good. They just should have. This should have been the first thing. And yeah. Kira never gets back to him with an answer <laughs> on this. <laughs> we are never told in this episode. Are Trills responsible legally for the action of their former selves? Even when we have a Trill expert witness later on. Yeah. So Odo at this point calls uh, from Clustron uh, to uh, Cisco, and he tells him that uh, Ar- Ardalan, Tandro, and Curzon were best friends. And when Ardalan was killed, he became a martyr and a national hero for his people, and it basically ended the war. Uh, it, it caused his troops to go nuts on the rebels, and they they won the war at that point. So, uh, and then Odo at this point goes to talk to Ardalan, Tandro's widow. And oh. we get, for some reason, she's living on the planet Angel One. <laughs> or uh, yeah. ha- half a dozen other planets that use the oh, same yes. matte painting for the The outdoors. same exact matte painting as Angel that was first introduced in Angel One in Next Generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just kept it in the closet and kept dragging it out for every they, ev- they probably didn't even that. bother pulling it out of the closet. Probably it's just the same exact tape, literally. <laughs> probably, probably. So she says that Curzon was definitely not responsible. Uh, she's very convinced of this. She says that they. W- there was a so what happened was there was a secret transmission from her husband's headquarters divulging information that led the enemy to ambush and kill him. Only five people knew that information, and all the others have alibis, apparently airtight, for where they were at the time of the transmission, except Curzon. And it's obvious at this point, given Jedzia's refusal to discuss it and the way the widow is asking, how is Curzon, by the way, not realizing he's dead, they were having an affair. Mm-hmm. Or were they? Actually, oh, I don't yeah. think, uh, well, when we get to the end, there is some question on that, but. but no, I don't no. think so. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. When we'll we get, get there. That, we'll but, get there. Yeah. <laughs> That's whether at this point, at this point, it's, it's heavily implied that they were having a pair. We'll just leave it at, for now, at least at this point. Right. Uh, she also apparently didn't realize that Curzon had died two years previously and that Jadzia is now the one being charged. So, uh, so this was mm-hmm. news to her. Actually, there's an interesting inversion here where at least now they're not going to go this way in the end. But what it looks like is Curzon was having an affair with the widow and the widow is the one who betrayed her husband, the general. Mm -hmm. And so the general was on his way. what, What the transmission was, was the route that the general was going to be taking. That was conveyed to the rebels and they used that information to kill him. So it's like he was manipulated into a position where the enemy could kill him. This is just like Uriah the Hittite in the Bible, only we've gender flipped it. It's not the king sending the general to get killed. It's his wife, who's Bathsheba, yep. who's sending her husband to get killed. Or not. Or not, because they're not going to go that way. But that's the way it yeah. sounds at this point in the episode. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, back at the hearing, Tandro introduces a Trill expert witness who's apparently... At least they tell us, the, the judge says, you seem to be here conveniently uh, t- uh, well-timed. No, no, we brought him along to deal with just such a thing, I guess. Uh, and so Tandro gets him to say that symbionts remember everything previous hosts did and feels what they felt. And then Tandro claims that letting Dax escape would establish the perfect crime. You can commit it and evade capture long enough to switch hosts, which... I'm not sure that's the perfect crime. Well, it's not necessarily the perfect crime, but yes, that would be a way of evading justice if Trill's, yeah. the Trill judicial system works that way. Let's have the answer to the question, does the Trill judicial system work that way or not? Yeah. Right, right. They, they don't ever actually bring that up. Uh, C- Cisco counters by noting that symbionts don't remember or participate in the life experiences of their hosts from before the joining. But the Trill points out that the joining is the blending of the two people a new personality emerges and which implies a new person yeah yes. and this is philosophically interesting in terms of uh moral theology the trill who is going to become a host is allowed to develop to a certain age so they can make an informed consent choice and it doesn't completely suppress their personality so on the one hand that's very interesting. Those are factors that weigh in favor of their distinct individual. On the other hand, it is an informed choice. And part of that is going to be, are you accepting the responsibilities for, 
for taking on this host and what this host has done before. And Madam Arbiter comes up with a great point. She decides to play Solomon and says, <laughs> okay, let's cut Jadzia in half. We'll take out the Dax symbiont, and it can be judged. And that leads to, of course, Bashir saying, sorry, can't do that. After 96 hours, they're biologically linked. One can't survive without the other, which isn't quite true. Jadzia can't survive without Dax, but Dax could be given a new host, but then that would just cause the problem all over again. Yep. Right. But we also get, and, and also he has medical testimony that their brain waves are different, which is fine. And that leads into a dispute about, well, have the symbionts brain waves altered? And, and Bashir doesn't know that, but he should, because that would be the subject of lots of medical studies on Trill, what happens to the symbiont. They're even more concerned about what happens to the symbiont in adjoining than they are what happens to the host. Right. But we do eventually get to a great point in terms of the moral philosophy of this, which is how do you, even if you could separate Dax from Jadzia, how do you know Dax was the criminal element? How do you know it wasn't Curzon mm -hmm. and he's already been punished by death? Maybe Dax was the innocent symbiont being taken along for the ride by a criminal host. <laughs> right. Uh, Cisco is now the witness at this point. He's called himself to the stand uh, because he's the one person present who knew Curzon, besides Jedzia, apparently, or Dax, the symbiote. Uh, and he, he starts by emphasizing how different Curzon and Jedzia are. And Pandro claims that Cisco makes this point for him, that both Curzon and Dax are guilty of any crimes together. If you put salt in water, they're indistinguishable uh, from one another because it's now just salty water. And Cisco says, but ah, if you boil off the water and put the salt in a different liquid, you have something completely different. Yeah. So, salty uh, water and salty milk are two different things. Exactly. Yeah. And is the salt, does the salt carry the guilt of the salty water with it to the salty <laughs> milk? Yeah, well, that, we've, I think we've taken that analogy too far. We, we shouldn't be too salty about it. <laughs> yeah. We have no, <laughs> no clear resolution uh, here. And we're told that Jadzia will have to testify next. Um, the, the judge says that. So uh, while we're waiting for that to happen, Odo calls again, and he says that uh, Curzon and T Tandro's wife were maybe having an affair, and that would be a clear motive for murder. And that, to us as the viewer, that looks clearly the, the case here, that uh, Dax is covering for uh, the widow. Mm -hmm. Odo then goes to confront her, the widow, with the truth, and she says that Tandro was not the hero in personal life, that everyone thought, but she's expected to carry on his memory as the brave widow. And I think that's actually a nice little moment here where she talks about what it's like to be the brave widow of the national hero, unable yeah. to marry again, for instance. That was, that was, a, yeah, that was really nice. Also, it was nice. There are a couple of nice things here leading up to this. One is to set a ticking clock for all this. Um, Madam Arbiter has called Jed Zia to the stand after a delay. Yeah. And Kira makes the point she has to testify because this is only a hearing, not a trial. Right. If it were a trial, she couldn't self-incriminate, but right. and she'd have the right not to testify. But since it's just a hearing, she doesn't have that right. And then, back on Klystron 4, Odo's talking to the widow, and she initially tries to pretend she didn't have an affair with Curzon, that he was just a close family friend. But Odo says, ah, but I checked the records, the communication records of your house, and there are lots of communications when your husband was not home. And she's like, oh, he's just a close family friend. So, of course, we talked. Yeah, mm. there are also records of gifts and holidays the two of you took together. Right. Oops. And at that point, she acknowledges, yeah, we were having an affair, basically. And I have to, he wasn't the hero you think, and I have to be the hero's widow. Right. She has to, even even though he was, it, it implies that he was a, you know, a bad husband in some yeah. form, but she has to remember him as a good man for the well, sake of society. Yeah. Cisco thinks Jadzi is protecting the widow's reputation by covering up the fact Curzon was having an affair with her. And Jadzi will not discuss this with Cisco. She says, you have an overactive imagination, Benjamin. And then he's like, dang it, if you were still a man. Oh, he, I know. It's like smacker one. <laughs> and he punches a wall. It's like, yeah. dude, Starfleet officer, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah Cisco's different. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but he he does have a uh, he does have a a a a good line here, which is, "Are you really willing to commit suicide over something done in another life?" Because yes. that's what it looks like to him. Dax is doing that. Jadzia is protecting the widow's reputation, even though she's going to be executed as a result in order to protect it because Curzon had an affair with this woman. Yeah, she's. He says. I'll stop trying to save you when you tell me that Curzon is guilty. And she says that when a joined trill sins, so she doesn't use the word sin, but essentially it was what she says, it stays with them forever so that she can't say which part of Curzon Dax sinned, the host of the symbiont. So she's kind of answering that question here. You know, is the, is the, is the symbiont in the, guilty of the host's transgressions? And what she's saying is, yes, that the symbiont is just as guilty because they're a joined person. Yeah. And at this point, Cisco is starting, because of how she just will not give the details on this, he admits to her he's starting to doubt maybe Curzon was guilty. And right. she acknowledges the legitimacy of that question. Right. He, he says, You're, are you questioning now? She says to him, what else can I do? He says, and she says, nothing, nothing at all. So uh, back on the stand, the judge says that at first she thought Jadzia was, I like this, I, I thought you were either 200 years older than me or the same age as my great-granddaughter, but now I'm starting to think both are true, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a nice little line. Um, Cisco starts the questioning about becoming a joint trill, and he establishes that she excelled throughout, Jadzia excelled throughout her life before the joining, that she earned multiple academic degrees, excelled in all areas of her life. Making it, you know, saying that here is a person who um, was He's accomplished in their own right. Yes, yes. And this is important, and it comes across in Terry Farrell's acting. Her mood noticeably changes as Cisco starts dragging out of her the fact she's got like five degrees and she's yeah. won all these awards, and it's a moment of healing between the two of them as he forces her to acknowledge her own good points because she's been living under this crushing Curzon thing. And now she's get she's being reminded, I'm an important person too. I have uh, my own accomplishments. And she's right. getting recognition for that fact. And that uh, that's something that would brighten anybody's day. Yes. Uh, Tandro starts the questioning and asks her if she understood the responsibilities of becoming a joint trill when she... Like, when Finally. She had... Yes. And the consequences they might entail, including the consequences of criminal acts committed by Curzon. But before she can answer, Anina, the widow, enters and says the hearing is unnecessary because the accusations are erroneous. She says Curzon couldn't have committed the crime because he was with her in a way he should not have been. Uh, well, specifically, at the time. she says he was in my bed at the time. Right. So unless she has sleepovers, they were having an affair. Right. And it's fascinating she's admitting this. Now, she's already said well, her her son has been obsessed with the memory of the father he never knew. So he, like everybody else on Klystron 4, idolizes his father. And now here's his mom admitting to her son that she had an affair. Claiming she had an affair. But it. But this is the, where I say... She, why? She admits it. Well, because later... Proved it. They had in the next gifts scene, and vacations together. Well, that, I mean, but in the next scene, <laughs> she says, she, she, I, I feel like they kind of walk it back a I, little bit. I, I, I don't, don't. Think, make your, make your case counselor. <laughs> well, because what she says is, is that the, the reason she's, they were silent was not because they were, they were a, afraid of their affair being public, but because mm -hmm. they didn't want to tarnish the memory of the general, which would undermine Klystron IV's whole basis for their national identity of this hero mm -hmm. would be yep. as if George Washington turned out to have been a traitor who was trying to betray the revolution to the British and got killed uh, when he went to go meet with them. Because that's essentially what happened is mm -hmm. it was yep. uh, Tandro himself who revealed his, who made the transmission uh, because he was going to meet with the rebels who ambushed him and killed him instead of negotiating with him. Okay. Um, agreed. We're agreed on the facts. We find out in the last scene, Tandro was the one who betrayed his own position to the rebels, and they killed him for it. And after this, Curzon and the widow agreed to, because it so fired up his troops, 
that they went out and won their civil war, and now they have a stable government on Klystron Four. And in order to preserve the memory of the fallen war hero that inspired that state, Curzon and the widow swore not to reveal that he was the one who got himself killed. Mm -hmm. That's all true, but that's an independent issue of does Curzon have an alibi for sending the transmission because he was in her bed? And yes, that's we're told there's only like five people who knew this. Curzon's one of them. The widow's one of them. Uh, the general was one of them. And then there are apparently a couple others. They all had alibis. The assumption was he wouldn't betray himself. But the other four, including Curzon, have alibis. Mm -hmm. And that points to, yeah, Curzon was having an affair with the widow, and he betrayed himself unwittingly to the rebels. Right. And the widow talked earlier about how her place in the history of the planet had to change. Or it was because she was no longer the grieving widow who lost lost her dearly loved husband it was she was actually sleeping around on him yeah behind the scenes as all this was going on anyways and she displays obvious concern that's meant to set us up for the idea of they were having an affair early on and then in the final scene with Jadzia it's clear they have enormous affection for each other even if it's not sexual at the moment it's clear that there's this huge bond between the two of them. And it, I read it as, yeah, we used to be having an affair when Curzon was here. I, I mean, I, I, I won't deny that there was a, obviously the, a huge bond of affection between them. Um, I think it's possible. I think the, the, the fact that they went on holidays and had, he sent her gifts, I think that's, that's, a, that's probably the strongest evidence. That's the, that's the strongest evidence of the oh. affair. I think it could easily have been her just making making up. It could have been, if without that line, it could have been mm -hmm. her making up the affair in order to save him without... Why? Re without why, would she, why would she well, do that? Who betrayed him then? <laughs> well... Is, to say under duress in court, uh, not under duress, under emotional duress, he was yeah. in my bed. Why would but, she so say that? So that they wouldn't undermine the memory of Tandro. That's like, because that's still preserved. No one knows that Tandro was the was his own cause of his own death. So yeah. she would have said that in order to preserve that. Yeah, preserve I, I I think taking the evidence as a whole, it points to both being true. Oh yeah, I mean I, I, that line I've forgotten yeah. that line about the going on vacations together. That okay. that is pretty. Cool. Father Arbiter, what do you say? <laughs> I, I, well, I'm, I'm not exactly an independent arbiter. I agreed with Jimmy from the beginning that it was it was pretty clear that. There, the, yeah. this really was an affair that was going on. Okay, I mean that's it. it doesn't it, either way. I'm, I'm not so invested in it, but uh, that's what I I thought. What uh, kind of Star Trek fan are you? <laughs> <laughs> not invested in it. Willing to go to the death over my really tiny viewpoint. Da, I know. Da, 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 da. Split off your <laughs> podcast because you know we we can't agree with each other anymore. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just going to take this Triax compound and pass out so I don't have to argue with you guys anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, I, that about wraps it up there. I mean, we we wrapped up the uh, the trial or the hearing as it is, and uh, we're going to go on from here. Uh, any final notes, Father Corey? Nothing here. Jimmy. Nope. I thought it was an, for a first season episode, I thought it was actually okay. I thought it was flawed in particular in that we should have gotten the central issue on the table, which they never even answered for us. Yeah. And then dealt with the ramifications of the central issue. But setting that major kind of structural flaw aside, I thought it was actually quite, quite nice. Okay. And Madam Arbiter totally rocks. Yeah, she was the probably the best part of this episode, frankly. <laughs> All right, so we uh, we want to take a moment to uh, actually. You, before I do that, I do want to point. Out, I forgot to mention Fiona, Fiona Flanagan. I mispronounced her name. Fiona Flanagan plays the widow, who also in, uh, will previously had played Data's mom, uh, the wife oh. of. Oh, uh, interesting. Of Sim. Love those. Sing. Love those Doctor Who tr time travel verbs. Who will have previously played. Data's mom. <laughs> yes, yes. We will see her. And she was, uh, yeah. I mentioned her in uh, our last uh, episode of Secrets of Star Trek as, as be, having played Data's mom, but uh, wonderful Irish actress who uh, does uh, another good job. So, uh, 
do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including John D., Joseph F., Ronald S., Austin T., and Christopher K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of dark, the secrets of Star Trek. And all mm-hmm. the shows at StarQuest, including The Secrets of Doctor Who, you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits my flubs out of the show every week. <laughs> so that's it from Except us. Except that one. Except yeah, that, one. that one. That one needs to stay. <laughs> that new one needs to stay, so you get to hear it. So uh, what do you think of this Deep Space Nine episode, Dax? Uh, let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek. Or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Voyager episode, Prime Factors. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, I'm 100 years old. I do not have time to squander listening to superfluous language. I intend to be in here till supper, not senility. <laughs> <laughs>